What if we were not alone? What if the hundreds of thousands of people claiming to have seen unidentified flying objects in fact had been witnessing extraterrestrial spacecraft? What if the thousands of people all over the world who tell about their encounters with alien beings through friendly contact or even forced abductions were actually telling the truth? What if our governments had known about an ET presence for more than half a century? If they were in possession of alien technology that had the potential of changing how our world is run? and they chose to keep the public in the dark through a secret campaign of suppressed information. What if that campaign acted as a chain around the ankles of humanity, keeping us from rising to a whole new level of consciousness and understanding of ourselves, our planet and the universe around us? And what if that campaign ended tomorrow? It's one of these currents of history that won't be denied. The truth is going to come out, and when it does, it's going to be explosive. So once we get that out, we will go back and completely reassemble the 20th century, rewrite it in a way, uh, and may have to go back and rewrite a significant portion of the entire last 12,000 years. This is the greatest story in human history. And the reason it is the greatest story in human history, it is the greatest story of human history. portrayed in this statement by renowned scientist Lord Kelvin in 1900 was shattered only five years later when Albert Einstein published his groundbreaking paper on special relativity. The new theories challenged the current framework of understanding and forced the scientific community to open up to a broader view on the nature of reality. This event of fundamental change, this paradigm shift, came as a huge surprise to scholars at that time. But today we have no problem following the string of breakthroughs leading up to Einstein's paper and the doorway into the atomic age. Lord Kelvin's statement bears with it the voice of paradigms past. We knew that the earth was flat. We knew that we were the center of the universe. And we knew that a man-made heavier than air piece of machinery could not take flight. Through all stages of human history, Intellectual authorities have pronounced their supremacy by ridiculing or suppressing elements of reality that simply didn't fit within the framework of accepted knowledge. The so-called father of modern science, the Italian astronomer Galileo, was even convicted by the Catholic Church and placed under house arrest for life after publishing a book where he supported the idea that the Earth was not the center of the universe. His work was then banned and forbidden for more than 200 years. But are we really any different today? Have we really changed our acceptance towards the things that won't fit the frame? Maybe there are concepts of our reality we have yet to understand. And if we open our eyes, maybe we will see that something significant has been overlooked.
My name's Nick Pope. I worked for the Ministry of Defence, uh, part of the British government, for 21 years. And for much of the early 90s, I was responsible for running their UFO project. The Ministry of Defence has been investigating UFO sightings since the 1950s and has about 12,000 reports in its case files. When I was doing the job in, in the 90s, I received about two or three hundred reports each year. In May 2008, the British government opened its first batch of UFO files for public inspection. The release, made available on the internet, created an immense media and public interest, with over two million downloads the first weeks. Other nations had just recently opened their files and more were to follow. France, Belgium, Ireland, Denmark, Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. The most amazing stories were revealed of craft, UFO fleets, landings and even ET entities being seen. Often with multiple eyewitnesses involved. Even if many of the reports could be explained as aircraft, weather balloons, satellites or planets or special weather phenomena, still a large portion remained unexplained. It is clear to me, given that these things are uh, seen by uh, police officers, pilots, military personnel, given that they are sometimes tracked on radar, um, it, it is clear to me that whatever the UFO phenomenon involves, there are uh, serious defence, national security and air safety issues at stake. The question if we are alone in the universe is as old as man himself. But now this question seems to be more pressing than ever. Today, science has discovered that many of our neighboring stars have similar planet systems. Over 500 planets have been registered so far. Some scientists even claim that our galaxy alone may have billions of planets with Earth-like conditions. So the idea of us humans being the only intelligent life in the universe seems to be losing its grip. Over the years, polls have shown that a rising number of people believe in intelligent life elsewhere. In many countries, far more than 50% of the population. The question of extraterrestrial life was also among the reasons why the SETI project was established back in the 1970s. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. This project, still ongoing, is using large radio telescopes at several locations on the globe to scan the cosmos in search for electromagnetic transmissions that could indicate intelligent life. This is the radio telescope in Bologna in Italy, one of the largest of its kind in Europe. This enormously complex system of antennas is able to detect even the weakest signals from the universe. And by interpreting these signals, the scientists are able to learn a lot about the age and the origin of the stars, the galaxies and the universe. And perhaps also detect signals from intelligent life. What we are looking for actually is not really a particular kind of signal. Uh, we are just searching for something different from the normal cosmic noise, so to say. So we are not searching for a particular transmission signals but for example it would be enough to detect some signals coming from their communications uh, televisions if they do have televisions or uh, cellular telephones or things like that well we have recorded a huge amount of data so far but unfortunately we could not get any signal yet But has the research been done for the right type of signals? While we are looking for answers inside the framework of our old paradigm, civilizations may be several million years ahead of us in technological sophistication may not transmit our type of radio signals at all. The most commonly used argument against interstellar travel is the fact that even our closest neighboring stars are several light years away. We have to move 20, 30 or maybe 50 light years out to find a substantial number of stars where life may be possible. 
With such distances and the speed of light as a limit, the thought of being visited from outside has seemed impossible. But new developments in physics have redefined Einstein's relativity theory and opened for a new view on this question. According to hadronic mechanics, uh, there is no problem with uh, space travel and not even with uh, time travel. Uh, the equations uh, and the physical models, uh, uh, concepts and relations uh, for explaining this uh, um, uh, has been clear for more than uh, 10 years uh, uh, in advanced hadronic mechanics. So if there are civilizations thousands or millions of years ahead of us, distances within 100 light years may not be a big obstacle. And is this why mysterious unidentified flying objects have been reported all over the globe through centuries? What really made the UFO phenomenon known to the public was what happened here in Washington in the summer of 1952, when a series of UFO observations were made during a period of two weeks. Objects were traced on radar flying a thousand miles per hour and they suddenly executed a 90 degree turn and other maneuvers that no aircraft could do even today. Uh, military pilots were launched to chase these objects. They got close enough to them to see they were round balls of light or oval balls of light but they could not catch them. It forced the Air Force to have a press conference on this. What is going on? And during the press conference the general General Sanford, who was in charge of Air Force intelligence, um, basically argued that as far as he was concerned, it was all natural phenomena and then there wasn't anything to worry about. So the press, being satisfied with that, publicized, you know, it was all weather in temperature inversions and weather phenomena that uh, were causing these sightings and you could forget all about them. A Navy officer who was working in the intelligence, in Air Force intelligence, told an FBI person that uh, several percent of the sightings could not be explained and that uh, the top Air Force people, some of them were con seriously considering interplanetary ships as the explanation. The pilot Kenneth Arnold had already in 1947 introduced the name Flying Saucers when he claimed to have come upon a formation of nine unusual saucer-like objects near Mount Rainer in the state of Washington in June that year. Before this, pilots of World War II bombers had named them Foo Fighters. These smaller discs were frequently seen as rapid lights crossing over German, Japanese and Allied territories. Sometimes right next to the aircraft, as if monitoring their operations. A recent release from the British UFO files show that Prime Minister Winston Churchill was very concerned about the UFO issue and ordered reported sightings to be kept secret for at least 50 years to prevent mass panic. He was also afraid it would shatter people's religious beliefs. On the night of February 24, 1942, only three months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, several unidentified objects were picked up on radar over the city of Los Angeles. It was believed to be another Japanese attack and resulted in an intense searchlight activity and heavy artillery fire. But the presumed enemy never fought back and suddenly the objects disappeared without trace. During the 50s, flying saucers were reported repeatedly, also by the civil and military pilots. And I could see that it was a black lenticular form, sort of silhouette with these blinking lights all over the surface. And it was at least twice the size of a 740, like two Boeing 747 airliners nose to tail. And it's between me and Indianapolis, so I rolled around and tried to get on its tail and or behind it, and it turned about 30 degree angles to the north and headed straight for Chicago and then went over the horizon like, like that and disappeared. There's no airplane can go that fast. And over the entrance to Hickam, uh, to uh, Pearl Harbor area, it's a, the entrance there was either nine, I said nine discs originally, so I'm going to keep it that way, with nine discs, white, perfectly white. 
And they were doing all kinds of different formations. A V, opposite L, reversed L, different types. We watched them for about 15 minutes. It's in a funny, pst, it's, they're off, it's gone. Uh, in 1952, orders were issued to military pilots in the United States. Shoot them down, flying saucers, if they don't land when instructed to do so. They have the newspaper articles proving that. Matter of fact, the head of the American Rocket Society wrote a letter to President Truman saying he didn't think that was a good idea. Not a good way to welcome anybody coming here. The American jet fighter pilot Milton Torres, stationed at the Manson RAF base in Britain, was on May 20th, 1957, ordered to go after and shoot down a large UFO, spotted on radar hovering over Ipswich. This enormous object, the size of an aircraft carrier, disappeared into the sky at the very instant he was to launch his rockets. I was thinking that if I fired this thing that uh, he may vaporize me. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was not of this earth. It was not a man-made object. This was something that was... <clears throat> they could stop. They could absolutely stand still, and they could go Mach 10 or more at any time. And a human being uh, would be splashed up against the sidewall from the forces of... of uh, just the momentum forces. Uh, that would de destroy you. So it was no, no, nothing that we humans know anything about. But many, many pilots in military planes who were ordered to go after and shoot down disks, they either disappeared or their planes crashed. This is another underbelly of this whole phenomenon. And before he died, Len Stringfield, who was the very first on the planet who had the courage to start publicly reporting that not only were there beautiful lights in the sky that moved in erratic patterns, but they were clearly involved with crash retrieval stories that were coming to him from military people who would not go on the record, that we were retrieving bodies, we were retrieving technology. And Len Stringfield said, Linda, I know firsthand that our government had a standing policy to take these disks down out of the sky until we had lost so many pilots that that order was rescinded around 1953 to 54. Books were now appearing on UFOs with pictures of saucers and cigar-shaped craft on close range, even with people claiming to have met the visitors in person. And soon the entertainment industry also joined the saucer wave. This somehow influenced on the image of the UFO issue, giving skeptics further reason for ridicule of the phenomenon. On July 1947, a major incident occurred near Roswell, New Mexico, the place where the US manufacturer and stored its newly developed nuclear weapons. A flying saucer is reported to have crashed. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. The incident is revealed in the local newspaper, but withdrawn the day after. Weather balloons is the official explanation. Today, several military and civil eyewitness testimonials have surfaced concerning both the crash itself and the crash retrieval operations, indicating that it most probably was a vehicle of unknown origin. Apollo astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon and also grew up as a Roswell resident, has recently gone public with his view on this controversial incident. I grew up in Roswell, New Mexico, which was the site of presumed alien crash in 1947, and which from what I call the testimony of the old timers who were there, and who had been hushed up by uh, government authority, military authority, on almost on pain of death at the time, <clears throat> and who had harbored their, their knowledge quietly for years, and when I came back from the moon, and I was a local boy, they considered me uh, safe enough to tell their story to. 
uh, that they were a part of the recovery effort and the obser observer of the so-called Roswell crash, and that they, they knew for sure that it was a, an alien craft. And subsequent uh, sightings, subsequent evidence has reaffirmed all of that, that we are being visited and have been visited by uh, uh, alien spacecraft and alien beings and our governments around the world have covered it up. In response to this escalating UFO activity and public awareness, in September, two months after the Roswell crash, Project Grunge, later named Project Blue Book, was established by the U.S. Air Force as an official investigative body in UFO cases. The project collected civil and military reports and carried out an analysis of them. In 1969, after 22 years, the project was closed without reaching official conclusion. And that ended, to this day, the official comments from the U.S. government on the UFO issue. But the UFO sightings didn't end. Going back to 1963, a command sergeant major in the U.S. Army was assigned to the supreme headquarters of Allied powers in Europe, in Paris, France, and was given the highest top-secret clearance. The story revealed to him there puts the phenomenon into a whole new perspective. And when I arrived in the summer of 1963, I was, my clearance was upgraded to cosmic top-secret, which was then and still is today the... Uh, the highest level of classification in NATO. And uh, when I arrived in the summer of 63, I learned of a study that was underway that had been initiated in 1961. <clears throat> Apparently, uh, an event had occurred on the morning of 2nd February 1961 that almost triggered World War III. A large number of circular metallic disks flying in formation, flew out of the Soviet sector over the uh, Allied sector in a divided Germany, flew off to the west. They turned north over the channel, over the English Channel, over the southern coast of England, and then they turned north and disappeared off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea off the coast of Norway. Well, this incident almost triggered World War III because the Soviets, we found out, thought those objects belonged to us. And for a time, we thought they might belong to the Soviets. We were to find out that they didn't belong to either of us, the Soviets or us, that uh, it was a real story here. And they initiated a study in 61 to determine what in the world is happening here. They concluded after this three-year study that uh, the planet Earth and the human race apparently had been under some kind of survey or observation for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, by several extraterrestrial advanced intelligences. Now that literally, Terry, blew me out of the water. <laughs> This document, called an assessment, an evaluation of possible threat to Allied forces in Europe, was a secret NATO report on UFOs, distributed in 15 copies in the NATO system. Could that indicate that NATO at that time was fully aware of the UFO and ET presence? The U.S. military took UFOs very, very seriously during all through the Cold War and indeed beyond. Um, we have a fair amount of evidence, documentation, military documents, intelligence documents that show very clearly that the U.S. military encountered objects that did not seem normal, did not look normal, and had an extraordinary behavior, violating sensitive airspace uh, again and again and again. So the question is not do UFOs exist, the question is who do they belong to? And indeed, guess what? This was exactly the question I discovered that U.S. military analysts asked. They were no dummies. So they knew there's only a couple of possibilities here. Question number one back in the 40s and 50s was, uh, are these Soviet devices? In the context of the Cold War, that's important. You need to find out. Did the Soviets 
come up with a revolutionary uh, type of propulsion and so forth. Well, they looked into it and, and the answer did not seem to be yes. It looked like it was a no. And indeed, that seems to be the answer today. So then question number two is, is this a secret project that we're doing somewhere in the bowels of the American military complex? That's a fair question. It's entirely possible. But again, it's also possible that that isn't the answer. And indeed, a lot of the evidence doesn't seem to point that way. Uh, the fact, for example, that our jet fighters were chasing these objects again and again is one thing that points to that. If it was a secret American project, why continually, year after year, scramble your own military to chase them down? So then there's a third option. And in the context of the late 1940s, it was, are they interplanetary spaceships? That was really the only other option people could think of at the time. And guess what? There were many analysts from the 1940s and all throughout the period that we can get any information on this. That yes, there were many people who argued that this was the case. Incredible stories continue to happen. Um, the most interesting of those cases occurred in November of 1965. Uh, there were UFO reports in New York State all over New England of objects being sighted above power lines, uh, it, over power plants, over power relay stations. Um, I forget the gentleman's name, but one of the FAA regional directors was flying in a private plane near Syracuse, New York, and they saw a large fiery ball pass over power lines at a place called the Clay Power Substation. And as soon as the object was directly over the lines, from horizon to horizon, all the lights went out as far as this man could see. And initially he thought that he had gone blind temporarily, you know, something had happened. And then he realized that <laughs> there was no power. And it, it became what is known as the Great Northeast Blackout. Uh, it's an incredible instance in, on 17 November 1986 of a Japan Airlines plane that was flying from a Tokyo I'm sorry, Tokyo to Paris to, to, uh, through Alaska encountered three large shelled walnut type objects. The largest was described intermittently in different reports as either the size of one or two U U.S. aircraft carriers. They were pacing the plane, they were making aerodynamic movements which were scaring the pilots. Uh, it's an amazing incident in that a possible five different agencies were all tracking these objects at the same time, namely the FAA, the CIA, NASA, the U.S. Air Force, and I presume Japan Airlines when the calls came in. It's one of the most heavily documented cases ever. There's transcripts that come out of the black box that, that were frightening. Uh, it turned out that the Reagan administration was excited about all this because they had never gotten so much documented information on a UFO incident ever in history. So they convened a scientific advisory board that in January was going to study all the information. As far as that scientific advisory committee, John Callahan, who was a senior FAA official, was on top of all this. He was excited too. He had looked all of the data. He said they never had anything this good. The scientific advisory board convened and they were waiting for the meeting to start. And according to Mr. Callahan, before the president even came in, somebody from the CIA came in and snatched everything up and said this never happened and walked out. The, the history of UFOs uh, in the United States is just, it's filled with one impossible sighting after another impossible sighting. The, the problem with them is that they have great military documentation again and again showing that they actually happened. Or what does one make of the boomerang craft that were seen in uh, just north of New York City in the early 1980s in what's called the Hudson Valley? For several years you have again and again these enormous objects being seen by thousands of witnesses. They're driving along the highway and they see this object hovering they get out of their car, their jaws drop open, and this intense bright light shoots down onto the highway like out of a movie. Except this wasn't a movie. This happened many times over a period of, say, five years, just north of New York City. In Great Britain, periods of extensive UFO activity kept the subject warm in the news media. 
a serving police detective within the UK force in England, has over the recent years gathered reports involving over 800 police officers having different UFO encounters. And here is one of the stories. His name was Police, police Constable Eric Raymond, and he was a police officer in the Thames Valley Police at the time of this particular site. And he was in a rural location in 1979, I believe it was, and he was stood talking with two other police officers, two vehicles parked up middle of the countryside, dark, no street lights or anything, it's just a very dark. And they're doing what police officers do at three in the morning, have a chat, have a cigarette or whatever. Suddenly in the distance to see bright light blink on for a, literally a second. It's a long way off, they look, it blinks off, they don't think anything to it. And just carry on talking. Five minutes later, this happens. And the object appears in front of them at a distance of about 400 meters, at an altitude of just 500 feet, which is very close. And they describe the object being the size of a football field. And it is shining a beam down the width of a football field across the landscape and slowly scanning the terrain. They think about going on the police radio and think, nobody's going to believe this. So they don't, they don't want the ridicule factor. So they watch for five minutes in all. The object is moving in total silence. And they say there are smaller objects flying silently around the larger silent object. And after, 15 minutes, uh, after five minutes, it goes, it doesn't go up, it doesn't go left doesn't go right, it disappears, like a light bulb. The 70s brought an amazing number of UFO reports from the British Isles, but nothing could compare to what was to unfold in late December 1980 at an NATO base in Suffolk, east of London. The Rendlesham Forest incident is Britain's most um, famous and compelling UFO uh, encounter. The file on the incident was made public a number of years ago under the Freedom of Information Act and uh, so the case files in the public domain but um, the bottom line is the case has never been explained. Peter Robbins spent nine years doing intensive research for his book giving a first-hand account of the case. His co-author Larry Warren was airman at the base at the time and one of the key eyewitnesses to the event. It occurred between Christmas and New Year's on three consecutive nights, 1980, and it involved overflights above this twin NATO base complex in Suffolk, uh, about 80 miles from London, landings, the shooting down of beams of light into the weapons storage area, which was a nuclear weapons storage area uh, very much in violation of our treaty with Great Britain at the time. And on the final night of the three nights, there was uh, the biggest incident. In this, my co-author, dozens of other American Air Force personnel were taken and brought out to a field near their sister base, RAF Woodbridge, where they saw the appearance of a machine of undetermined origin. At that place an object appeared on the ground in the place of a mist. I saw this happen. A red light moved in, exploded. It caused retina and eye damage to most, a lot of us peripheral people. A structured object was in its place on the ground. Though you couldn't look directly at it, you'd have to look at it with your peripheral vision to get the shape. Uh, entities were seen. How many? Three. Uh, looking very translucent, uh, not your what they call gray, and you know, all that sort of thing. It was almost ghost-like. Very much animated, self-animated though. Uh, that whole event was filmed. Did in they photograph. walk out of the craft? They didn't. Did they well, no. They, they were the floating uh, about a foot above the ground in a very bright light. The lower extremities were very hard to see. They were a foot off the ground. Uh, they were about four feet tall. They had that same large cranial structure, the giant black sweeping eyes, almost no nose, a hint of a mouth. 
and they were each dressed in a suit, very tight fitting, and they were slightly translucent and they were floating. So they got in about five feet from the thing. They were right there. And the beings were no further away than like 20 feet or so from Larry. So this was all happening in extremely close proximity, very close up. Larry and other men there observed, besides the dozens of American enlisted Air Force personnel, many of them like Larry with secret clearances because they worked around nuclear weapons, but there were British police officers on location. They were from the nearby village of Woodbridge, and while the American Air Force personnel were filming this with video, and this is 1980, so you could you could spot a video camera a long ways away, it was very bulky, uh, but also regular film cameras. One of these police officers was taking photographs of this landed machine with the 35 millimeter camera. And from what I understand, the Air Force confiscated this camera from the police officer, which caused a bit of a fight. When these beings appeared, they looked at the human beings and the human beings looked at them and no hands were shaken, no things were exchanged. Um, if anybody heard voices in their heads, I don't know about this. And at a certain point, these beings, they did not open a door and walk in, but they disappeared. And the sense was they had gone back in. The machine then lifted up it was making a slight humming sound, my best description. It angled slightly and then, and it was a star, you know, in a matter of seconds, and it was gone. What happened the next day is almost more upsetting to me, namely that these men were debriefed. Uh, I think they were told a combination of truths and lies to overwhelm them, intimidate them, keep them quiet. And then that night, a number of the individuals, Larry and Adrian Bastinza next to him included, were taken against their wills, subdued chemically, and put through a series of procedures to confuse and upfuse their thinking, and were released a day or so later, right before New Year's. Three years later, this incredible story had leaked to the media and created a long succession of headlines as more and more information was revealed from different sources, Larry himself being one of the main sources. But no official comments on the UFO incident were given from either the US or the British government. All the unique film and video material, including the pictures taken by the British policemen, were removed from the base by the US military, never to be seen again. In 2009, Larry King and CNN shed new light on the case by bringing in new eyewitnesses confirming the story of the first night of the sightings. I was there on the first night. Uh, I went off base to, uh, 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 to check out a possible aircraft downing. I thought it was an aircraft crash and I took a my team with me and when we got to the uh, wooded line off the east gate, uh, we discovered a uh, craft of unknown origin. It was triangular in shape. On the ground? On the ground. Did you touch it? Touched it, walked around it, photographed it. Um, we did a full investigation of it on the ground for 45 minutes. With this exceptional testimony from a retired U.S. Air Force security officer live on CNN, confirming the story of several other eyewitnesses, you might expect it to lead to some kind of official reaction. Does the Rendlesham case actually tell us straight out that there is another reality in the midst of our lives able to come and go as it pleases? In other countries, UFO observations were made continuously. In Brazil and the huge Amazon area, UFO and ETs were observed almost on a daily basis. You know, historically, Brazil is one of the uh, major countries as far as uh, UFO sightings and contacts with aliens is concerned. Now, we have, we have all sorts of cases and they are spread all over the country. Now, the, some of the most astounding cases in the UFO history happened in Brazil. We're talking about landings, we're talking about face-to-face -face contact with aliens, which are 
getting rare for some reason. And we talking about also sightings with multiple witnesses. Sightings in the middle of the cities, like uh, two or three thousand people seeing a UFO. But what about Russia and the former Soviet Union? Russian Navy is not, has not been known to reveal its secrets, but Russian Navy has been known to be in the forefront of the UFO and USO research. And we have reports coming basically from all corners of the world, be it the South Georgia Island or the Barren Sea, or for example, especially the Sea of Ahotsk and such uh, lakes like the Lake Baikal. They had encountered not only gigantic underwater objects and submarines who could move at incredible speeds, and the Soviets just could not catch up with them, they had also encountered disks that would basically fly out from under the water, go into the sky, uh, separate into different objects, come back together, fly away. They had encountered a phenomenon which was called kvakiri, from the Russian word kvakat, meaning to emit a sound like frogs would do. What it meant is that Soviet submarines, especially in the Atlantic area, would find gigantic moving objects at great depths of the sea. Objects that would emit certain sounds that kind of reminded them of croaking, but it, it, you know, they were different sounds. They could do nothing about this, but the Soviets became very nervous because these gigantic objects would accompany them. And of course, they thought the Americans came up with a new way to track Soviet submarines. They found out this was not so. In 2008, we received over 867 uh, sighting reports from 37 different cities in Turkey. And out of those, 35% uh, of them were d documented. And 20%, 15 to 20% of them were unidentified. In Turkey, one of the most amazing recent cases is from the town Comburgas, an hour away from Istanbul, where a security guard captured astonishing UFO footage over a three month period in 2007. The film clearly shows the outline and the structure of the object and also what seems to be the silhouette of two beings inside. The film has been thoroughly checked by a governmental scientific institution. In the official report it says uh, clearly that this is not a hoax at all. This is not a computer animated hoax or a model or anything like that. There is a uh, physical object in the picture, in the footages that we could not identify. They put it they categorize them as unidentified flying objects. Astonishing video has also been released from Mexico. Military gun camera shots of traveling UFOs hit the news in 2004. And even more astonishing, fleets of UFOs were seen and filmed over several cities. As a result of the rising national interest in the UFO issue in Mexico, one of their main broadcasters has run a two and a half hour show every Sunday night the past 15 years, presenting the latest UFO documentation. Well, I have a television program every Sunday night from 5.30 to 8 o'clock. It's prime time in the Mexican television. Uh, and we present the news around this phenomenon. It means the most recent videos, the most recent photographs, the most recent cases, the investigation behind that, the actuality Many people in the media and even the public have been brainwashed by the scientists who don't want to investigate this. But there is enough evidence, scientifically proved, based, that can be investigated and presented to the scientists. And they have to ac accept and agree that, they, that this phenomenon is real. There is no question in my mind. I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for almost 40 years. And I know because I've seen them, because I've seen creatures, and um, because I know it's true. Behind me here, inside this blue container, is the only stationary, fully automatic, 24-hour UFO observatory on the planet. In Norway, the remote mountain valley Hestalen became world famous after almost continuous observations from the early 80s on. 
Strange lights moved up and down the mountainsides every night over long periods, just above the treetops. In contrast to many other countries, scientists arrived and established a permanent UFO observatory. The light phenomena here in Hestal in Norway started uh, in late 81, well, uh, with a lot of sightings. At the most it was 20 sightings a week. The local people here started to see the light down in the valley, sometimes close to their houses. And uh, they were wondering, what could this be? And there were, some was a little bit afraid too, because no one could give them any answer. What could it be? Radar and cameras were soon to pick up astonishing pictures of the unexplained light phenomena. This picture is taken with 1 60th of a second exposure. The phenomena behaves very different. Some is moving very slowly and some lights can move very fast. The fastest speed we have ever measured was 30,000 kilometers an hour. But the local residents claim to have seen more than just lights. Men när det kom mest upp på toppen upp på kjøren der som vi ser. Der var det opplyst rundt med. Det var det opplyst som dagen. Se kom det nå for over bil. Det var som en opplyst herrehatt. Gammeldags slik stor herrehatt med brem på det. Som for over bil og fremover. The observatory shoots pictures automatically every minute and puts them on the internet. Many amazing shots have been captured. After an automatic video recording system was put up, one year of waiting passed before the Hestalen phenomenon is caught on camera. Zooming in and slowing down the film, something really astonishing is revealed. A smaller second light seems to appear from underneath joining the main light. Is something collected by the light? Landings were also reported and even solid proof was found of earth samples being taken in the midst of nowhere. Here, a two hours walk from the nearest dirt road, a two-ton piece of wet turf has been cut out with laser precision, lifted and placed a few meters away. No sign of machinery nor people. During a week in September 2007, a major survey was carried out by the university scientists, assisted by students with several observation units. On the fourth night of the survey, the phenomenon decides to show up. big light that started out and moved very quickly north and south and gave us this very very impressive uh, picture which possibly is the best picture ever taken of the Hestalen phenomena. The exposure time uh, was 30 seconds so we see that the Hestalen phenomena moves from uh, starts up here and uh, moves down and then goes up again here. Uh, the distance here it's approximately maybe from 10 to 15 kilometers the distance it has covered and uh, uh, the camera has an optical grating in front of the lens and uh, this grating make this optical spectrum here the one thing that is uh, that surprises us with this spectrum is that it's uh, continuous the colors goes directly over in over in the other color here, and we see no the, no lines or dots here, which will give us a signal of that we have a gas that is burning. This looks like a optical spectrum from a solid object, or from plasma with high uh, density. So it's still too early to say for certain what the origin of these lights is and what these flying objects really are. 
But one thing we can state as a fact, the phenomenon is here and it's real. And what about the UPAN sightings in Belgium? The Phoenix lights in Arizona? The UFO at Osaka Airport, Japan? The UFO landing in Voronezh, Russia? The ghost rockets in Sweden? The Col d'Avance sightings in France? The UFOs filmed in Milan, Italy? The UFO fleets over Peru? The UFO hovering over Chicago O'Hare Airport, seen by pilots and ground personnel? and the large UFO forcing the Shaoshan Airport in China to close for four hours in 2010. It goes on and on. Well, of course, at this late date, there is just an abundance of uh, documentation, military reports, radar sightings, uh, personal experiences. They go back for many years, uh, but they have been routinely ignored, shunned aside by the government, ignored by the media, and therefore the average person rarely gets to hear of these things. But when you put them together, it forms a very compelling picture that there is a reality that's happening all around us that uh, we are being systematically uh, denied information on. Uh, I've had many people say, well, look, if all this happened, wouldn't there have been military people and radar operators and even policemen and stuff that, who would have uh, said they had these experiences? And the answer is absolutely yes. But early on, the, they learned their lesson. If they step forward and they said, yes, I saw these things, then they tend to lose their job. They lose their credibility. People begin to snicker at them. And that's been very effective over the years in keeping this whole issue quiet. I know that if they took an oath not to reveal that, in our country that was very serious at that time, okay? If you violated a top secret clearance, you could be put in jail for 15 or 20 years and everything you have done removed from you, yeah. Could this be why the military observations never reached the public? But many who had been involved in UFO sightings over the years felt a strong urge to reveal what they knew and to be relieved from the burden of carrying these secrets. After 30 or 40 years and having retired from service, many were willing to break their oaths and speak publicly. They could stop at a dime, they can take off at Mark 10 or greater. It's unbelievable what they can do. So we need to know these things. So. The only, the only reason I'm here is to tell you, let's disclose this whenever we can, please. Thank you. Thank you. In 2001, the U.S. medical doctor Stephen Greer staged an initiative where several hundred witnesses of high rank and high credibility came forward with what they had experienced during service. The Disclosure Project, helped by the Internet and YouTube, was a formidable eye-opener to people all over the world. So we started a project that's known as the Disclosure Project, which people can see at disclosureproject.org, uh, where we began to identify military and corporate and CIA uh, intelligence officers who had personal knowledge of the classified uh, operations dealing with this subject, and to get them to come forward uh, with our information to disclose this publicly. Because what we felt was necessary was that the secrecy should be ended and this information disclosed so that humanity, not just one country in America, but all of humanity could make peaceful contact with these civilizations visiting us, but also would lay the foundation for these new technologies, the energy and propulsion systems that are behind these UFOs that are so mysterious, how are they flying? Well, this is understood, but they are in classified projects. So that was the, another objective, was to get the technologies out to the public so we could have a civilization that would get freed from the use of oil and uh, the destruction of the environment. There were probably 1,500 reported cases at that time. Uh, I have uh, over 3,000 cases now. They estimated 100 yards from the left wing was this 100-foot disk. And the strength of the signal was as strong as the surface contact on the water of an aircraft carrier. This, this contact was huge. The size of these uh, uh, objects around uh, 100 meters or greater. So it would go from 1 o'clock, 7 or 8 miles to 
uh, six, seven o'clock, seven or eight miles inside of uh, four or five seconds, uh, you have to be moving pretty quickly. They could rise, uh, just go straight up. Uh, they could uh, do that, just seemed like instantaneous. Once they started moving, they went straight up, you know, for a while, and then they went zap. Then it just sort of disappeared, it dematerialized, and left the, at the atmosphere just was gone. He just took off into space. He said, you are never to speak of this again. As far as you're concerned, this never happened. And you never saw this, and I don't exist, and this situation never happened. I didn't want to look at it any longer than that because I felt that my life was in jeopardy. I am prepared to state that I have been at locations where craft of, un of unknown origin that did not originate on the face of this planet was there. I am prepared to state that while I was there, we saw living, dead bodies of entities that were not born on this planet. I am prepared to state that we had what, we, what they referred to as interfacing with those entities. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country, but from some other solar system and I have been a party to that. What some of these witnesses also revealed were observations of UFOs hovering over storage sites of nuclear weapons and nuclear rocket launch sites. The big increase in all the sightings around the world happened at the time when we began to detonate nuclear weapons. This is not an accident. And I've been told by senior intelligence officials that essentially a big red flag went up over our planet saying we were in trouble. But not only are we in trouble, but we could be a threat to others because you combine going into space, the early stages of space travel, and the use of uh, hydrogen bombs and nuclear weapons, uh, and a civilization on Earth that was still very violent, as you look around the Earth even today, of course. So this is something that any enlightened or even uh, self-interested civilization observing the earth, which I think we've been under observation for thousands of years, would be co greatly concerned. Over the last 35 years, I have talked to now over 100 people, about 115 nuclear missile launch officers, targeting officers, missile maintenance personnel, and missile guards. And these individuals, for the most part, do not know each other. Some were in the Air Force in the 1960s, some were in the Air Force in the 1990s. And uh, they were at different bases, but they all have very, very similar stories. And what they describe is UFOs coming in very quickly at high rates of speed and instantly stopping and hovering, either over the underground nuclear missile launchers or what are called launch control facilities that launch the missiles. So after the missiles malfunction, the UFO leaves. Now, this has occurred uh, at at least three Air Force bases that I'm aware of in the United States. The event, the incident, I guess I'd, I call it, is uh, happened uh, on the morning of March 16th, uh, 1967. As I recall, it was early in the morning. Um, and I got a, I received a call from my topside uh, security guard and said, sir, there's a, there's a glowing red object hovering right outside the front gate. He said, I'm looking at it right now. It's a glowing red object. I've got all the men out here with their weapons drawn. Uh, and of course, he was all shook up while he was telling me this. He was very excited. I immediately went over to my commander who was taking a, a nap we have a little cot down there it's in a rest period. And uh, I was telling him about the telephone call we just received. Then as I was relating this to him, our missiles started shutting down one by one. Uh, there were approximately uh, anywhere from six to eight that went down, but they went down in rapid succession, which again is an extremely rare. And in the meantime, I called upstairs to find out what the status was of this object. 
tried to, and uh, the, the guard said, well, the object has, has left. Um, it just, just left at high speed. <laughs> Numerous well-documented UFO sightings by numerous credible people. Flying saucers tracked on radar, chased by fighter pilots, nuclear missile sites malfunctioning after UFO visitations, and even alien beings witnessed by police officers and high-ranked military personnel. Where does all this leave us? Four major conclusions after now 52 years, 51 years of study and investigation. First, the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some UFOs, some, underline it 20 times, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about the ones that aren't. I'm a nuclear physicist. I don't care about the isotopes that aren't fissionable. You want to build a reactor? Use the one that is. Who cares about the rest? That's the first conclusion. Second, the subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic water gate. That is to say, some few people within major governments have known since at least 1947, when at least two crashed flying saucers were recovered with alien bodies in New Mexico, that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Notice I'm not saying everybody in government knows. That's not how you keep secrets. I worked under security for 14 years. Need to know is the important factor. The third conclusion is that none of the arguments made against the first two by a small group of noisy negativists, when I'm being polite, stand up under careful scrutiny. They sound great until you look at the data and then all those anti-arguments collapse. And the fourth conclusion, because I'm such a shy, retiring kind of guy, is that this is the biggest story of the millennium, visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover of the best data, bodies and wreckage, for 62 years. Extraterrestrial beings from somewhere have, are engaging us and this planet and have been for at least since the, the, the mid 20th century and possibly for as many thousands of years back as you care to go. That's a fact. That's an absolute certain fact. It's been proven many times over. Since the 40s, the governments of the world, and certainly the United States government, the main the, the industrialized governments, have been aware of this. Right? That's a fact. Uh, it's been proven. The uh, United States, with the cooperation of most, if not all, of its allies uh, from World War II, uh, made a decision to embargo this fact and the acknowledgement of it, formal acknowledgement of it, from its citizens. That's a fact. All right. And what is happening is that 62 years after that truth embargo was uh, formally and informally and formally inst instigated, that it's now coming to an end and that uh, we are soon going to be, be uh, uh, informed by these governments that the ET presence is real and begin the process of learning about it from the governments, right? And from all of the citizen scientists and activists who have been pursuing it without the government support. Uh, and that information will be uh, pushed forward and into the public domain. That's in its simplest form what's going on. But why did the government instigate a truth embargo? And how could the secrecy continue till this day? The concern in the Pentagon in the 1940s when suddenly you have these very strange objects appearing that don't seem to be American and don't seem to be Russian, um, if they are spaceships, we might, if we tell the public about this and be candid with them, there could be massive panic. Um, the first chief of uh, Project Blue Book, Captain Edward Ruppelt, when he left the Air Force and wrote a book in 1956 about what the Pentagon knew, he stated that in, in the Directorate of Intelligence at the Pentagon, uh, there was open discussion and ongoing discussion about we cannot tell the public the truth because they will not handle the truth well. They also didn't want to alarm the people because their job is to defend the United States and they couldn't stop these UFOs. They went with impunity anywhere they wanted to go, okay? So the military never wants to admit 
that they couldn't do anything about this because that would be to admit they were defenseless. If we have recovered a spacecraft in 1947 at Roswell, that technology would be so superior to human technology that the Pentagon certainly would keep that a secret, even from America's allies in Europe, um, to try to you know, create our own UFOs. So if a war with the Russians, the Soviets happened, we would have the advantage because of this superior technology. Um, that would be one reason for the secrecy. But they had a formidable problem because while it's easy to decide, okay, we're not going to talk about this. We're not going to reveal this. ETs are all over the place. They're being seen, filmed, photographed, seen by pilots outside of cockpits, year after year after year. At the same time, they're trying to maintain a policy that there's nothing there to be to investigate. So they had a really tough job. It, it's easy to say we're going to build a, a super bomber and put everybody under oath and you know, uh, classify the whole program and, and maybe even stick it underground and build your secret bomber. That's easy, right? But this was not easy. Uh, the extraterrestrials can come and go as they pleased. They could come and uh, contact people as they pleased, abduct them, apparently, if they wish to. And the government has to somehow maintain this false reality in the face of all that. So the truth embargo was not just a simple decision and extremely difficult to implement. The amazing thing is that they did. They put an enormous amount of money, time, and effort into this truth embargo and succeeded. From the 70s, Hollywood engaged profoundly in the ET issue, knowing that there was a growing interest in the general public for these topics. The popular movies also had the effect of making people more familiar with the thought of a widely inhabited universe beyond our own planet system. In the 90s, people started recording their observations with the new handy camcorders. Today, thousands of UFO clips are posted on YouTube. But unfortunately, with the sophisticated animation tools now available on home PCs, it's almost impossible to tell the real from the fake. So this has made both video and digital stills documentation less reliable as evidence or proof of sightings. But in spite of this growing interest in the subject, the main news media have left the UFO phenomenon almost untouched. In terms of mainstream news coverage, this topic is not taken seriously. It's, it's basically a non-topic. So how is that so? Here's how. It requires an understanding of the relationship between most of the mainstream news media and global intelligence communities. So what that says, that doesn't mean that the CIA controlled everything, but that you have to understand the media acts in certain choke points. So for example, a UFO sighting might get local news coverage, but that doesn't mean that it gets covered on the wire services. That's a very different situation altogether. And skeptics will argue, well, this phenomenon is so big it would have been covered, but really what that betrays is a lack of understanding of how news media has been related to intelligence communities around the world for, for decades. And I call upon our government to open up like other governments have, and you will hear about that this morning. Like the Bell when CNN covered a press conference in Washington, D.C. in 2009, where Dr. Edgar Mitchell encouraged U.S. government to release its UFO files, the hope was that the issue finally was given serious news coverage. Former Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, told the National Press Club he's convinced. But there isn't convincing proof that's going to convince the entire world at this that point. That is correct. That is what we're trying to open up. We're about to go out and do our little hoax. Equally but CNN chose to let two boys with air balloons have just as much time in the report, demonstrating how they managed to fool UFO believers. Again, we're not trying to prove or disprove anything, but... It's okay to be skeptical. <laughs> okay then. Jim, thank you very much indeed for that. Jim Acosta there. You bet. 
Well, the role of the media in the your flying saucer phenomenon is a, is a very, very important one. I, I think it's very clear that uh, in the United States, at the very least, that there were efforts uh, during the very earliest days to try to get the media to basically uh, dampen down expectations and dampen down public enthusiasm concerning extraterrestrial life and the flying saucer phenomenon. And this is actually documented. And ever since that, we have seen many, many examples of how the media doesn't really explore or doesn't really investigate flying saucer reports and that uh, various media organs have been brought out uh, by the CIA. For, exa for example, the National Enquirer was actually brought out by a CIA asset who used it as a very clever way to debunk uh, flying saucer reports by basically sens sensationalizing it, making it part of the kind of tabloid media whereby serious media investigators would not do any research into a flying saucer report that had been in any way uh, covered by the National Enquirer or these these tabloids. So that was a very piece, a very clever piece of uh, psychological warfare, in my opinion, to try and get the mass media disinterested in the flying saucer phenomenon. So it's a very very complex issue, and it, the, the secrecy isn't that hard to maintain if you have this sort of infiltration into major institutions, media, and also the ability simply to float nonsensical s stories out there. Because people hear the word UFO and extraterrestrial, they think somebody from a trailer park in West Virginia who's floated on t board a spacecraft had sex with someone from Mars and claims they have a baby in an incubator. Or, you know, but just all kinds of nonsense. The truth of it is actually more interesting. The truth of the technologies and the fact that the extraterrestrial technologies are so advanced that they interface directly with coherent thought. Like we have coherent light in a laser, they have technologies that interface with thought, that interface with conscious mind, uh, that their development of artificial intelligence that's integrated into these spacecraft is so advanced that they pick up on a directed uh, it's fascinating and this is what we've been experimenting with and the whole paradigm becomes a new paradigm of understanding the structure of the cosmos but uh, the most of the information that's out in the public on this issue has been a carnival of silliness and that keeps most serious people sort of in the closet on it is this the reason why so few scientists engage in the UFO subject the fear of being associated with the silly side of the issue. Is this also why it's never commented on by astronomers or by space organizations such as NASA? Uh, this is not just a simple civilian organization. There's a great military connection here. There's a lot of classified uh, security clearances involved in being able to work at NASA. You can't just stroll in there. So these are people who fit a certain personality profile. That is, they know how to follow orders, they know how to keep their mouth shut, and uh, you know, keep their head down and their career will do just fine. That's how most people are in, in, who live in a bureaucratic world. This is how secrets are kept. There are, there are open secrets that are kept for years and years and years because people agree just not to talk about it. And I think uh, that within NASA this is very likely the case regarding the UFO issue. But like Dr. Edgar Mitchell, people retired from NASA have commented on the issue. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has told the world straight out about encountering a UFO at close range during his flight in the Mercury capsule in 1963. And before he died, he also stated, For many years I have lived with a secret, in a secrecy imposed on all specialists in astronautics. I can now reveal that every day in the USA, our radar instruments capture objects of form and composition unknown to us. I would like to believe that we could invite serious scientists into this arena because uh, it, is, it, it will be changing the paradigm of science as we know it. We know that these craft are not traveling with fossil fuel gas, that there is a technology behind them, that maybe this technology could help the earth and renewable fuels. Uh, if we could get scientists just to use that motivation, to look at the technology behind the craft, then maybe we could invite science to, um, to come and, and change the paradigm of, of, of uh, 
uh, transportation of, of electromagnetism, of all these really advanced technologies, but we need to invite them. I think too many are afraid of ridicule. Uh, too many. I have encountered many that are curious but are not willing to go public. Um, so it, we're changing times now, and for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and the future, some scientists are going to have to take the risk. Well, it's my hope that we open this whole issue up. <clears throat> and as I have said uh, frequently, uh, we're at a point in history where we have to become a part of the neighborhood of ha inhabited planets, uh, rather than like a, like a neighborhood of a community, uh, which we have not even acknowledged that that community exists up until this point. An event with the power to institute a global revolution in technology, communications, energy supply, environmental concerns, and even the way we regard ourselves and our fellow beings. A paradigm shift of unprecedented proportions impacting nearly every part of our existence. Is this what we are facing? And will we have to rewrite our entire human history? In the hollowed halls of national security agencies and the Pentagon, the top military, top security people, the top people know essentially this reality. But the masses of people don't. And the people in authority, the elite as it were, the uh, power brokers, uh, have desperately tried to keep the lid on this thing because, Terry, it's not simply uh, visitors from another planet or from another star or another galaxy or even another dimension. It's not simply that. It isn't that simple. We've, de -learned, we've learned over the years that several of these intelligences have been involved with us from the beginning of human history. And the evidence has been collected that the human race literally is a hybrid race and that some of these advanced intelligences from wherever they're from have been involved in genetically manipulating us as a species from the beginning of our history. Man is a hybrid. From a lower order, we've been genetically manipulated by advanced intelligences into what we are. Now that in itself is dynamite for God's sake. Have alien visitors thousands of years ago been involved in the creation of the human DNA? Is that why we have never found the missing link? In 1930, in an ancient mine tunnel in Mexico, a strange skull was found which is different from anything seen before. This 900-year-old cranium, which has been named the Star Child Skull, differs from humans and all other primates in several extraordinary ways. The bone structure is only about one-third as thick and the weight is less than half as much as human bone. Still, it's more than twice as durable as a human skull and has a never-before-seen web of interwoven fibers acting as reinforcement. The head of the Star Child Research Project, Lloyd Pye, has, through research at several scientific institutions, been able to conclude that it's not a misshapen human skull. So by, by the end of 99, uh, I had convinced myself that it wasn't a, a human deformity and I had stacked up all these physiological differences. But none of those physiological differences, either individually or all together, meant anything to science. In 2010, DNA tests were conducted in one of the leading laboratories in the United States. The results were compared to hundreds of thousands of different species through the enormous DNA database of the United States National Institute of Health, NIH. So when they, when they sent the Star Child's um, uh, results into the NIH database, some of it came back with, without any doubt as part human, I mean, as, as, as human DNA. It, they could tell you where it sat on what chromosome. It's very precise. And several dozen of those came back, so it was just no doubt that part of the Star Child is human. No doubt. But to their great surprise and, and everybody's surprise, 
part of them, another percentage came back, not found in the database, meaning not found on earth. So that is a very strong indication that the father's contribution is not from earth. It's not human, it's alien. The fact that the star shell clearly contains human DNA while at the same time having a radically different genome altogether is a strong indication of advanced genetic engineering. So what the star child does is it opens up for debate, serious debate, that argument that we too are genetically engineered. If it was genetically engineered 900 years ago and we can prove that, then it's not a real big step to consider that human beings were created 200,000 years ago by genetic engineering, as the Sumerians say in their tablets, written 5,000 years ago. Can this Mexican skull actually confirm the reality of genetic engineering in our ancient past? With the results of the DNA testing, this relic is now considered an archaeological sensation even though the scientific establishment refuses to acknowledge it. I am convinced based on you know, years of research that we right now collectively, the mass of us are as ignorant in our understanding of reality as were the people 300 years ago who believed that the earth was flat and that it was the center of the universe. The idea that the human race perhaps has a past and an origin very different from what science proclaims today brings us to possibly the most bizarre aspect of the UFO phenomenon, the so-called alien abductions. It first came to public awareness in the early 1970s, when stories began to surface of people being taken on board alien craft after being rendered passive. Incredible stories were revealed and the remarkable similarities between the stories is what has triggered the interest of researchers. My colleagues and I have heard directly from thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people over the last 20 years about uh, their abduction experiences. And so we know that uh, this is a very, very, very prevalent phenomenon throughout, uh, probably throughout the world. The first thing I recalled was um, seeing three fingers and a thumb on a hand come towards me to pull me out of the van. Uh, I was uh, more than a little frightened. I was quite traumatized by it. I was very awake sitting up and uh, had no reference for this. I was removed from the van. My friend remained asleep beside me. Um, and as I stood at the end of the van, there was um, a being that I could not look at, a very tall, what, I, what felt very large and very tall being standing in front of me, but I was not able to raise my head to look up. On each side of me, there was what I've since come to understand is referred to as grays, one on each side of me. My hands were hanging down at my sides and um, they were, without touching me, with their hands underneath me, they were levitating me somehow off the ground, about uh, five or six inches. Um, I was fairly paralyzed, not able to look around. I could look down and see one at each side of me. And uh, we began to move forward. They go through a period where they kind of calm down, they're put on a table, um, and certain examinations take place, certain procedures. Very often there are areas of skin removed, leaving a little circular scar in, in depth, which you call scoop marks. <clears throat> we don't know what they do with this flesh, but it's taken. And uh, there are often reproductive procedures which involve with men sperm samples being taken and with women needles which go in the abdomen um, or in the vagina, but we believe this has to do with uh, harvesting ova. Fetuses are implanted, little tiny embryos. Fetuses are removed. These are, this is standard material. This is standard stuff. 
they're taken off the table or taken into another room. They might see a bunch of babies in the other room. They have to hold the baby. Women have to feed the baby sometimes. Uh, uh, they might be taken into a room where they see, well, let me just say that the babies that they see are strange looking babies. They look sort of like half human, half alien. Sometimes they look more human, actually, um, but still odd. Uh, they're taken into a room where they see toddlers sometimes, kids who are maybe two, three, four years old, uh, who um, uh, are playing with some toys. Uh, they play with the children, uh, play with the toys. The toys are unusual uh, toys. Um, they uh, have these neurological staring procedures with the children who will look into their eyes very closely. They uh, might have other procedures where they'll see uh, a room filled with vats, jars, I should say, containers, clear glass or clear plastic or whatever, containers with fetuses in them in different stages of development. Um, they will uh, have all sorts of other procedures that, are, that happen to them. They're then taken back to their normal environment, put back where they were on the couch, watching the television or whatever, and they forget immediately what happened to them. All they know is that they, they were watching one television show, and not only is that show over, but the next two shows are over with as well, and they're still sitting there, and maybe they still, they put the can of beer in their hand, they still have the can of beer in their hand. And they figure, what, what happened? Uh, and then they just forget it. Can't explain it, and they just move on. One person described a drawing of, of the, the table. She didn't put anybody on the table, but she described the aliens around the table. The regular little aliens were about her size. She was, I don't know, she was maybe eight or something. But there was this one tall one. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the one who's sort of the yeah. one in charge. Drawings of abductors have been made by many abductees, where the large eyes and the small cheek seems to be typical characteristics for the so-called gray alien, named after the skin tone. See, one of the interesting things about this is that all the evidence we get confirms the reality of this over and over again. It doesn't disconfirm it. The so-called hybrids, allegedly a blend of human beings and gray aliens, Female, is today uh, reported in a majority of the cases figures. investigated. Alien eyes, but with what oh, seems little to be girl. A, it was the alien, I mean, the hybrid child. The hybrid child. Yeah. And what's interesting, again, the eyes are very peculiar. Yeah. The hair was not combed or brushed, and it wasn't, didn't really cover the head properly. Okay. And uh, she's one of the mothers. So what said. it seemed to be was that there was a program in, where people were picked up again and again and again as if they had been studied, they were being studied over their lifetimes. And they were sort of automatically part of a program which was genetic in function. And uh, it seems that we discovered that if a person was having abduction experiences and had children of his or her own, a normal human children, that often those children would also in turn become abductees. As if the aliens were studying a particular bloodline for perhaps psychological reasons, emotional reasons. Uh, we don't know, we don't know exactly w why, but they seem very interested in the way the minds worked of these people. The emotions, they don't seem to have the emotions that we have. And uh, it was as if they wanted to kind of learn our our range of emotions somehow. It seems as if in a strange way we're teaching them <laughs> without being asked to. It's involuntary teaching, but we're, we're being examples as if they want the richness of the human spirit and the human emotional life um, to be somehow blended with their own incredible technological gifts. I really understood that they covet and envy the emotional makeup of humanity. They can't, they, can't, uh, they can't find it in their testing. They're trying to find it like we do 
like on this planet, an, animal behaviorists, as they study animals, will watch how they react in a maze. They're doing the same thing to us, trying to find out what it is that motivates us. What motivates motherly love? What is this intangible thing? They can't find it and they want it. They're frightened of it and that's why they subdue us because they realize that it's a volatile thing and it's unpredictable on one hand, but on the other hand, I believe they covet it. In this particular experience, that came out. And I began to try to define, and I said, I got it, you want what we have. This is what's got the species fascinated with us, why we are so incredibly different. And in, in this instance, I realized that we may be on the forefront of something that some of the other species are not. So what if emotions are actually, an ex actually part of the highest evolution possible? And perhaps we as humans are at the forefront of this, and we're clumsy with it. We don't know what to do with it in our evolution. But instead of being behind these other species who have none or almost no development, maybe we're at the head of the game. Why would so many species be interested in Earth? Why would so many species be interested in humanity in this way? Why? If we are one of, of a billion planets or a million whatever planets that could be sustaining life, why this little, tiny, tiny, little, nothing planet? Why would we have this kind of activity if there wasn't something special here? I believe that may be it. Another bizarre phenomenon is reported from people who claim to have been in contact with ETs and then detecting a small foreign object in their body, which is considered to be an implant. The rare characteristics of these objects led to a study by a medical doctor and surgeon. After removing several of these considered implants and having them analyzed, amazing results were presented. Uh, we found that the uh, biology uh, of the object, found the object is covered with a biological membrane which seems to prevent the human body from reacting to it by any kind of a rejection or inflammation reaction. We find that there's absolutely no wound or portal of entry or scar where these things uh, entered the body. And looking at the metallurgy, uh, we find things such as uh, a meteoric iron. Uh, we find the nickel-iron ratios that are similar to meteorites. Uh, they've been tested in numerous laboratories now, uh, Los Alamos National Labs, New Mexico Tech, uh, University Labs, and uh, many, many other laboratories. Uh, in this last case, um, in addition to that, uh, we find that there are structures uh, such as carbon nanotubes, uh, multi-rectangular sodium chloride crystals. Uh, we find that there are a, a list of elements, uh, says uh, americanium, uh, sumerium, uh, a number of different elements that are not normally found. Uh, we also find things like um, many numerous uh, isotopic ratios which indicate the material does not come from here. And in addition to this, as an example, we find that in existence by itself in this, lad, in this last object is uh, uranium-238, which uh, on the Earth cannot exist by itself. There's both uh, biological and metallurgical uh, evidence here which is beyond the shadow of a doubt uh, most uh, compelling and indicates that the human race is is been and has been for perhaps many years being interfered with by some non-terrestrial intelligence the way this thing looked when you looked up at it but are the abductions of people only conducted by one particular group of aliens? Are there other alien groups that contact individuals on different bases? So I know of, I would say, at least 60 kinds of extraterrestrial beings that have visited the people whom I work with. And this information all comes through the regressions that we have done. Now, some beings come to be mentors to their human beings. And by the way, the beings seem to work with a person for the person's lifetime. They looked very human. 
their hands were not at they, their hands were very different though um, their hands were the fingers were much longer and uh, they were very very thin uh, very long a little bit longer necks they had uh, white hair and it sort of came up a little bit here into a v-shape the hair um, a little bit wavy and about shoulder length and they had quite large blue eyes um, a perfectly formed small nose and smaller lips when I was on board the craft they gave me these blonde beings gave me information that is relevant to our time on this earth right now and they gave me messages that they asked me to share with really anyone who will listen they're very specific for um, the humanity of, and how we have a choice that the process in which we are evolving if we continue on the path that we're on that it will be just no choice we will it will become destructive it was explained to me that they have been here in the past um, they have said we have come in the past to help in the process of change on the earth and we are here once again they have been here since the beginning of the creation of man and that they are here to only assist in maintaining this earth protecting it from any and all things that may harm it and that includes us so when if, if nuclear war were to try and be brought upon the earth it will not happen they will stop it because it would be the destruction of the earth so this is the only time that they will step in on a grand scale is if great destruction were to happen to the earth itself or to every human being on the planet are we part of a silent universal interaction that has been going on for eons could there be something in the human genes that carries the echoes of alien ancestors? Is this why we seemingly are being monitored like children in a playground? Is this why the UFO activity escalated after the first atomic bomb? Do we as a species represent a value beyond our wildest imagination? And when are we ready to be informed? The disclosure is going to happen very soon. Now, there are very potential positive implications of that, and then there also is a dark downside to that if it's not handled with wisdom. One concern I have is that there must be great discernment exercised, not just by the leadership of our governments, but also among the population in general when suddenly our society is confronted with the fact that there are advanced cultures here and what the implications are for our interaction. And even if those who suddenly appear in our midst have only benevolent intentions and truly want only to uplift humanity and assist us at this very crucial time in our planet's history. There will be the temptation for those who are already in the material seats of power in human institutions on this planet, who will likely try to distort this opportunity to enhance and entrench their own control and material power. And all that is, it's a continued extension of the same ego disease of the separation mentality that has plagued humanity you know, ever since we learned how to say hello to each other. So we have to call for great discernment. And that means that people need to become educated. We need to understand that our source is the same. Erwin Schrodinger, who was the father of 
quantum mechanics and particle wave theory stated a hundred years ago or so that the total number of minds in the universe is one. And in fact, that the consciousness is a singularity phasing within all beings. And this is also the heart of compassion of the Buddha and the source of the oneness spoken of in spirit in, in all the religious traditions and Native American traditions. And I think that we are going to have to return to a very deep spiritual understanding of what it means to be a conscious being, to be able to not only live on this planet peacefully and not blow each other up over sectarian differences, but also to go into space. Because when you look into the eyes of an extraterrestrial life form, they may be very different from us in many ways, but if you see that that being is conscious, and the light of that conscious spirit is the same as the conscious light within yourself, then you can find some common basis. And so, if we understand the single source of the, of the origins of our conscious being, this is true not only for humans, but it's also true, very much true, for these visitors. They understand that, because you cannot travel at multiples of the speed of light without crossing the light barrier. And when you do, you enter into this area that the mystics used to call the etheric astral conscious realm. And so you're dealing with civilizations who understand that. And I think that is the big test of our civilization at this time, is that we understand that deeply enough that it really does change our paradigm. And when we do, we're not going to be blowing each other up because of different interpretations of uh, this, this Bible or this Quran or this uh, religious figure or what have you. That we're going to understand that we really are all one people in the, in the entire cosmos. That universal consciousness and universal understanding, to me, is the thing that will truly transform life on this planet and is the next big leap in human development. When the children of tomorrow open their textbooks on human history, what will they read about? Will it be the story of how the Catholic Church imprisoned Galileo for supporting radical theories? Will it be the story of how the scientific community laughed at the idea of flying machines, even years after the Wright brothers demonstrated their first airplane? Or will it be the story of how the world openly ignored an extraterrestrial presence? Will the children of tomorrow laugh at us for being blind, just as we easily laugh at those who firmly believed the earth was flat? Will they speak of us as the people of the old world, the last age of solitude, the day before disclosure?